Hi, everybody. My name is Noelle, and I uh, look after the marketing at Smart Media Technologies. I'll expand a little bit on what I do and what our company does. Let me first introduce you to our panel. I have Jolly here from Spark World and part of the Zebu founding team. I have um, David <laughs> from Known Origin. I have Premila, who's a private investor into the space, and then Holly from Rarible. So um, Smart Media Technologies, we're a global team, and we are an enterprise Web3 company. So what we, we have a tech stack that really helps brands, agencies, creators move into the Web3 space with success. So we basically make Web3 easy. We work with some of the biggest brands and agencies that um, you would know from Unilever, um, Yahoo, Accenture. Um, and uh, we're very passionate about where the NFT space is going, which we believe is more about utility than the speculative market um, uh, that we've been seeing. So with that, I'm going to pass to each of my guests to just unpack a little bit about what they do um, and their role at the company. Well, I've always wanted to be a singer, so... Uh, so I'm, I'm one of the founding members of Zebu, but I also sit with a Spark World hat on, so I'm the CEO of Spark World. And what we're trying to do is kind of three main service pillars. So we're all about maximizing NFT experiences. Um, and they're kind of split into three main categories for us. That's minting, so primary sales, so bringing projects um, to communities in a fair, transparent way. Um, and the way we're doing that is a novel uh, protocol called Fair Predictive Launches, and it's essentially the gamification of whitelisting and minting and distribution. Um, so there's a lot to unpack there, but I'll uh, leave it for later in the speech. The second is a marketplace aggregator. So uh, kind of alongside secondary marketplaces, which is your kind of your open seas, your rare rules, super rare, um, a marketplace aggregator is where you can have a one-stop shop. So it aggregates all of the listing and sales and purchases across every marketplace on that chain. So it's easier for the, for the user to do everything in one place. And the third is our proprietary protocols. So this is our kind of like guest to earn mechanics, daily, weekly, and monthly prediction tournaments on volume, which community is going to do better, uh, and all around bring some more like fun experiences that can be rewarding for your knowledge on NFTs. So that's it in a nutshell. Brilliant. Thank you. David. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm David Moore, one of the co-founders of Known Origin. Um, Known Origin is one of the early digital art marketplaces. We're built on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, I guess some people describe us as some of the original pioneers. We kind of launched our platform in 2018 and then spent the last couple of years building a community around the platform, listening to the community, figuring out what creators and collectors want, and then building those features. Um, 2021, obviously, everyone, the world woke up to NFTs and lots of platforms kind of struggled with the demands that came into the space. Uh, fast forward to now, recently been uh, acquired by eBay and we're growing uh, an amazing team uh, and building out some cool stuff. Pramila? Hi, everyone. Um, Pramila Mathen. I am... Um started my career in finance, and then I was on the finance side of the art world. Um, always interested in art tech, art data, art startups, um, art finance, and then found myself deep in Web3. Um, I had a, quite a valuable asset that I sold to one of the whales in the space. Um, some of you may know uh, Punk6529, uh, so I do some work for him. I also manage my own portfolio. Um, of NFTs, uh, direct investments, and also some indirect, um, very small sums, so, you know, no, I'm no whale. <laughs> and also consults for some, um, some other VCs, um, mostly not public, but one in particular will be public soon. Yeah. Fantastic. Hey, hey. Um, I wanted to say thank you so much to Zebu Live for inviting us and putting this panel together as well. And so I'm Hollywood. I am head of artist relationships at Rarible. I'm sure most of you know Rarible, like Known Origin, um, one of the very early NFT marketplaces. Um, really, Rarible is a whole ecosystem for creators and uh, builders. Um, it's the rarible.com is kind of like our lead product, I would say. 
built on the wearable protocol. Um, but what we're going to be seeing coming up, and actually in the very near future, literally within the next one to two weeks, um, the launch of some very new exciting products, um, really expanding that wearable ecosystem. Um, and actually ties into some of the conversations that you were going to be talking about as well, Jolly, which is really cool. Um, but really my role at Rarible at the moment is um, working with artists and creators, um, providing them the tools and the knowledge and the information around really all the possibilities and potential of what Rarible is and does. Um, it's a multi-chain uh, marketplace. So I think we support five or six chains now, literally just uh, did a soft launch with Immutable X last week, and I'll talk more about that shortly. Brilliant, thank you. So I'm gonna take a, a first take us to where we are now, and then I think we can look to the future. Um, and you know, pausing on what David says, which I think is a huge success uh, kind of for the Web3 space and acquisition from a company like eBay. Um, so for me, that seems to make a lot of sense. Uh, eBay was one of the original peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces. And then moving into this space now, um, I'm really curious, David, about your thoughts on what that signals for the overall market. I think um, the intro we had before the, before the panel was about phases. And I think we've had the kind of innovation phase. I actually think we had a phase before that called like experimental, where we had people like us and Rarible that were quite maverick and kind of figuring out what this all meant. Um, but I actually think the collectors were quite maverick as well because they were taking some big risks on a new technology, a new asset class, a new industry. And then we kind of hit the kind of innovation where we saw lots, and you'll probably agree, Holly, we saw lots of marketplaces appear quite quickly, uh, trying to establish market fit and kind of figure out who the who their communities were and figure out where they fit into the kind of whole ecosystem. Now I think we're at that point where we're gonna start seeing, especially towards the end of 2022 and 2023, bigger brands come into the space and trying to figure out what it looks like at a mainstream level. And that kind of movement to mass adoption, let's, we all know that eBay has got like millions of users. Um, they are, like you said, the kind of OG, peer-to-peer -peer marketplace, so if you were, back in the day, if you were an individual that created something with a passion, that was the marketplace that you could list almost anything from almost anywhere in the world, and they would basically be the marketplace that helped you find a buyer. Mm. That's not dissimilar to what's happening now in the kind of Web3 NFT space, so we empower artists or creators to list something, and then we find a collector or a buyer on the other end. Mm. So the, the actual alignment and synergy with what happened in Web1 to Web3 is quite close. Um, I think that's, that's the interesting thing for us is it's how do we make Web3 less scary to kind of non-crypto users that want to participate. And I think this, this whole movement's only gonna work if we bring millions and millions of people into the space. I think I read a stat today around 2.5 million active wallets on OpenSea. Mm which is like... That's nothing. Yeah, if, we, if you zoom right out, we're actually in a really still quite niche yeah. industry. When we started in 2018, did I think it would be the, the start of a brand new industry type? No, but I can totally see how digital assets and the kind of collectibles categories is absolutely where the direction of travel is. Yeah, and, and so we have a SaaS platform which allows brands, creators, anyone to come in, build their own marketplace, uh, drag and drop no code, but we still find that we're helping them, right, to move in. And, and, and even part of what we do is offer full custodial services because, as you say, there's only 2.5 million wallet holders, right? So it's like, how are we moving in? How are we moving towards mass adoption? And part of what we're doing is we're saying, okay, well, we'll meet you where you're at, kind of 2.5, offer the custodial services, and it's one way to start on that kind of on-ramp. But, um, yes. That's definitely one way of looking at it, like the Web 2.5 mm. and a nudge to Web 3. I think they, um, but there's still some really big kind of high level challenges there for, for kind of anyone that's out there. It's like, what does a frictionless onboarding experience look like? We're still, people are still figuring that out uh, across the boards. Um, how do you educate? How do you educate like, people have really only just figured out like how to get the best out of Web2. Yeah. 
And now we're saying there's this new thing called Web3. Like, it's, <laughs> this is the future. It's like, that seems really overwhelming. So there's a, definitely a big shift towards, like, education. Yeah. Um, and I think it's an exciting time because I definitely see more and more people can see the use cases for NFTs. So I always describe NFTs are actually just digital receipts for products or services. Yeah. Um, the layer on top, whether it's a piece of art or a film or a, p a photography piece, it's like that's just attached to this digital receipt. So I think once people understand where the crossover is, they kind of get it more. And I think around the education, there's a bit about um, the conversation has to start with do you do people see a digital piece in the same? Do they value it in the same way as a physical? And I think that's where the conversation has to start. And I think we find that hard, but the generation after us, like my son, yeah. totally gets it. He understands the value of digital items and assets way beyond even my kind of comprehension. He just, it's just built into him, he just gets it. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm super excited to kind of, we're talking about the future of NFT marketplaces. I think there's gonna be a big swing towards educating this new audience. Uh, and I think there's gonna be a big swing towards kind of this, 2.5 to 3, I think that's going to be really interesting. I think they're kind of re reducing or removing some of the friction points that we're finding now. I think there's going to be some big, big plays in that. And is there any plans within that space that you can share that you are developing? As I think we're excited by all of those things. Yeah. <laughs> it's like all, you need right. to kind of consider all of those things to make it work. Yeah. But I think we're right now we're we've got, we have an awesome team and we're building a bigger team so we can move quicker and experiment with things and figure out what works. Um, but yeah, I think right now we're just excited by a lot of the potential that's there. And that educational piece takes a lot of time and resources. It's content heavy. It's yeah. uh, you've got to find the people that know what they're talking about. It's like it's not just an in-house thing. It's across multiple kind of people and platforms and. Yeah. A shared story is better than just like one person trying to push out a bunch of narrative. So, yeah. yeah, that's why we kind of have relationships with Rarible, we have relationships with Super Rare, OpenC. It's like still quite cooperative, mm -hmm. which I quite, I quite like. Like collaboration is like how we got here. So like, yeah. why would we change that now? Yeah. So no, it's a super exciting time. I feel like I'm monopolizing the. Well, the I was chat just about bit. to go to Holly here. So <laughs> Holly, I think that's a nice segue into you were talking about the marketplace that you guys are now developing and some of your plans in process and what's in the near future. I'd love to hear more. So yeah, we literally launched, I think, like a couple of months ago, the community marketplaces. And this is essentially a way for um, artists um, and collectors and curators to build their own NFT platforms, essentially. So they can do that completely independently of Rarible. Um, literally, on your Rarible profile, you have a little button that gives you the option now of building out. So it's a, like a little one you know, push of this button, and you've literally created your own NFT marketplace. Um, we also offer that as a white glove solution, a little bit like yours, Jolly. Um, but what was really interesting for me is, like, for instance, we were so kind of like committed to like growing the ecosystem. We didn't even have Solana integrated on the main marketplace. Right. And we actually launched the DGN Ape Academy as our very first Solana project as a white label solution. Um, we just launched a, a, a marketplace for Pixel Vault, um, which has been very, really cool. Um, that's I think about seven collections. Um, and the community have been really, really excited about it because essentially it means that one of their biggest issues recently with the kind of like um, hype and conversation around what Pseudoswap are doing and those kind of guys um, is the, um, you know, honoring secondary, secondary royalties. Yeah. And so that's a real challenge for a lot of these projects. Um, it wasn't part of their roadmap at any point to not have those secondary royalties be part of their treasury. It doesn't help kind of like build out their ecosystem. Um, so for them to take ownership by having their own custom marketplaces means that all of those royalties are honored are, and are kept within the community. Um, so there's kind of like huge benefits there for them. Um, 
But yeah, I was also going to mention, you know, in terms of like other kind of innovations that we're working on, you know, we really are committed to the multi-chain um, direction. I had amazing conversations with a, team, a couple of projects on um, Avalanche downstairs. So I'm excited about that in the same way that, you know, what Magic Eden did with Solana, what we're doing with Immutable X. Like we literally did this soft launch, I think, last week. And then within the first six days, I had to write it down. I was just double checking the data <laughs> we there was like four million dollars worth of volume with 84 percent of market share on you know just one chain and in this market that's incredible so wow. to me that's really exciting and that's connected to metaverses and to gaming so we're actually starting to see how like um actually there's a talk coming up later on this afternoon about data which i'm really excited about um it shows how kind of like you know being a bit more data driven kind of like really you know, thinking about who these audiences are and kind of like connecting the dots, but working in a really collaborative way. It's like there's no point in doing all of this and building this if we're not going to share this knowledge and information. Um, so, you know, I would totally recommend for everyone to kind of add Immutable X because it's going to be a really fun kind of like ecosystem, I think. And do you think as part that the future for NFT marketplaces will be more... A integrating the metaverse and integrating, in, integrating gaming like you were saying, do you see that also as being more and more the case? I think it's going to be about uh, choice for consumers, if we want to talk about consumers. Right. Um, I think it's about giving them options and letting them decide. So, like, you know, I was just talking to the Popsicle team downstairs and they're working on a really cool gaming website as well. You know, the fact that you're going to be able to buy NFTs within the game yeah. as bundles, but maybe you're not into gaming, but you still want a tradable asset. So you're then going to do that over on their NFT marketplace. Mm -hmm. So it's just thinking about those kind of like different routes and different kind of um, places that are, you know, that the community want to hang out in yeah. rather than kind of like saying you have to go in this direction. Yeah, yeah. And and data can help you to figure that out. Yeah, exactly. Um, so actually, I'd like to just double click on the royalties conversation, because Jolly, I know that that's something that's really near and dear to you guys and part of like your core proposition at Spark World. Yeah, so I think there's a lot of things that are going on with royalties at the moment. I think that we touched on like the primary sales being a big chunk of money that comes in up top for the NFT projects. And I think from 1st of Jan to the 30th of June, there was 2.7 billion in primary sales in NFTs, um, but actually only 200 projects uh, netted over 1,000 ETH. So, and they had kind of like 70% of like the market share of all, of all of those primary sales. And I think that when projects are relying on secondary sales or like they don't get the primary sales to like facilitate their continued growth or like uh, execute on their, ro uh, on their roadmap, they can fall a bit short. And so there's this big squeeze on creators where there's sort of three main stakeholders. There's the marketplaces who want to gather users, there's the actual creators, and there's the community. And they all have quite varying objectives. And we're into a quite a unique position where community are getting a lot more say in Web3. Um, a lot of stuff is, um, like everyone's already said today, community-centric. They want to push what is decided by the community, what they create for them, um, and obviously they want as low as royalties as possible, um, but finding that balance act between what creators get, what marketplaces take, and what communities are demanding is proving very difficult. And I think that you're seeing some marketplaces going to 0% royalties, um, saying they're gonna take away creators' royalties. And so we're in a new, unique position where no one knows what's gonna work, everyone's trying lots of different things, and it's an interesting spot because what's gonna work short term or gonna gain more traction might not be the long term solution and it could be like faltering for some of the projects to have to be forced into saying like, okay, look, all of the royalties are just gonna go into a community pot and not for development of the actual product. So there's a lot of conversations around the projects we try and work with and come and launch and uh, what we take in, in that kind of process that I think is gonna define how those projects end up playing out because there's a lot of projects that end up faltering, you know, and I think they get a, they get a tough time as a wider point. Eight out of 10 companies fail. And I think that what the difficulty is in the Web3 space is it's so public. Everyone's already bought part of that company yeah. or that project or that NFT or that token and it, and it goes to zero. So I think 
there's a lot around the sustainability, and rather than everyone trying to take their cut or demand what they want the most, no mass optimization problem is ever solved with an extreme solution. So like a zero or like a five or going all the way up. So I think that there's a balance that has to be struck and it's the, the collaboration that David was speaking about is what's so important that we're all on the same team mm -hmm. to garner mass adoption for NFTs, which is a quite a generalized term. I think just touching on, uh, David was saying there, digital receipts, but I would say they're almost more like a, like a mobile phone. You know, a mobile phone's a, a step counter. You can take your blood pressure on it. It's a camera. And I think like NFTs, I'd describe it sort of as an analogy, like a football. So a football, if you were to be really simple with it, it's just a, a leather round ball. But what it facilitates is 22 two players playing a game. There's goalposts, there's infrastructure, there's fans. Yeah. There's so much behind what an NFT is. And I think that the royalties part of it has to be super unique to what solution they're trying to bring. So that's a, a little bit roundabout, but yeah, there's there's so much going on there. Well, right, and you have a very unique vantage point because you're one half of Zebu, so you're seeing all kinds of you know deal flow, if you will, and what what works, what doesn't. Yeah, and, and so from a, a lot doesn't. <laughs> well, do you have any like pointers on that? Like, if you were to say. You know, and if, if there's anybody out there, I guess, in the audience who's who's in the space or looking in the space, from what you've seen being kind of Web3 agency side. Um. So, yeah, I think there is an element of people being, wanting to appease the community. And it's a word thrown around a lot and mm. understand very little. And I think that there's always, part of making a product is making what people want. But there's also an element of being like a thought leader and making what people have not, not thought about. Um, you've got your Henry Ford who um, increased pay for factory workers and made weekends because he decided that people wouldn't buy and drive a car if they didn't have a weekend and they didn't have enough money. You've got companies like Airbnb who are trying to change everything to remote working because, and that's more of a marketing ploy because when everything's remote working, what do you do? You go to Barcelona for two weeks to work from home and you get an Airbnb. And so I think there's an element of you have to create your own meta, which is like your new trend cycle, your new hype cycle. And it's like as much of community appeasing that you can do to be like, this is what people want us to build. There's got to be an element of saying, no, this is something I think that is going to change what they want. Right. Got it. Interesting. I was just going to say, no, well, I just thought of a brilliant strategy for Airbnb. Yeah. Then he just to offer all of us a deal for Lisbon. <laughs> that like, is a very good let's go. January. <laughs> let's go. <laughs> totally. Um, Premila, I'm going to... Well, my original question to you, I might have to pause on, because now that I know that you looked after Punk 6592, we have to hear a little bit of that story, I think. Um, I mean, so, so what I find so interesting is that, like, for me, that showed how a NFT, a character, could become a character, right? Um, and I don't know if that is also what if we're looking at when we look at the future, when we look at creators maybe coming into the space. Um, and is there fractional ownership in some of these NFT characters? And can those then transition into, uh, you know, Netflix shows and to other... Do you see any of that, like, happening in, in the future? More of that happening? And any of... Well, or yeah, so where, 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 where di di different NFT characters, assets actually become characters within, um, that are developed. I don't know, Holly, if you have any opinions yeah, on this. Ab absolutely. I mean, there's huge initiatives to make that happen. I think, yeah. You know, Yuga, it's already happening with, um, with Yuga. Um, they're leading the frontier on intellectual, intellectual property rights. Although I have question marks on, you know, what that means in different jurisdictions and what that means, you know, in different industries and, you know, in, I, I, you know IP is something that's thrown out a lot, but I don't know in terms of actual legalese how, how sticky it is. Yeah. I think that's probably a whole different topic. Um, but certainly, I mean, there's, um, so you go leading the way, but also, um, for example, like you have Reese Witherspoon's production company, um, Hello Sunshine, who's um, going to do things with, um, scripted and unscripted uh, television shows and yeah. you know you have apes that have started a beer band or um, uh, a, a band a music band um, you have yeah. 
you know, Moonbirds, I think it was a Moonbird that was um, Kevin Rose's project that um, was starting a tequila brand, but unfortunately, they then, uh, Moonbirds then announced that they were going CC0, which is, uh, I don't know if the audience knows, Creative Commons, where you don't have copyrights, which is the other extreme, and uh, I think there's, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of elements in Web3 where you can look at the spectrum, and, and I think, you know, sometimes it's controversial, IP, no IP, centralized, centralized non-centralized, mm -hmm. or decentralized. Um, you know, there's other other things like that. But I think what we need to consider is what model works best for the particular case in point. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you know, we're we're all here for this greater decentralized dream, but actually, it doesn't always work to be completely decentralized, right? Mm -hmm. so, and so, you know, I still want the government to pay my roads, for example. So. <laughs> And if something goes wrong, I want someone to help, right? <laughs> yeah, you want someone yeah. <laughs> in the call center answering <laughs> yeah. if, if the house is burning down. So, yeah. so, so by being an investor in the Web3 space, I think you're by default a futurist. And I know I love that. Please call me a <laughs> futurist all the time. I should just introduce myself. <laughs> um, 12 months is a long time. 18 months is a very long time. But in this space, but if you were to look forward, um, that far. Do you have um, any opinions on what you think that the NFT marketplaces will look like? Um, so I am most concerned with um, the kind of tools, infrastructure, picks and shovels that will lead us to mass retail adoption. Mm -hmm. Mass adoption, but particular retail, I think that we have institutions already coming in and they are obviously more sophisticated. Um, in terms of the uh, new generation of marketplaces, I think that it will be dependent on the evolution of um, the technology and the evolution of the assets um, that will very much reflect. So, you know, I think that we will see certainly upgrades to security, number one, self-custody you know, is sometimes problematic. Um, if you know, we don't yeah. know what we're doing. I, I I struggle, admittedly. I'm not the most techie person. And, you know, I sometimes believe nothing bad will ever happen to me. Touch wood. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah. So security, user experience, uh, and the picks and the shovels are going to help to drive all of that, right? Yeah, hundred percent. Are you so, investing into anything in the space specifically, or with picks and shovels, or just so generally that's what speaking? I'm focused on so security. Yeah. Um, user experience, um, user interface, um, interoperability, that's a huge problem, particularly for gaming. Like, it's, if you look into the detail, it's like actually shockingly bad how it's lack of interoperability we have. Um, I would say also payment systems, you know, the integration to various exchanges, access. Um, I'd say you're gonna have a lot of non-marketplaces becoming marketplaces, you know, it's probably just as Every Web2 firm ha had a website that became their shop front. You will have the same where, where every brand will have their own exchange system. A lot of them paying zero fees. You know, we see it already. Um, like for example, with G Money's Admit One, mm -hmm. just you, it just brings traffic to their sites. Um, and there's re really very, very little barrier to entry. Right, you just take an open source protocol and you can build it into your your website. So that's certainly what I see as the future. We'll probably see more apps. We'll probably see um, you know, more ways for people to pay. Uh, I mean, distributed ledger technology is allowing this creator's universe, it's allowing uh, new ways to make money, to use money, to, um, you know, interact with money. It's, you know, these are, David, I think earlier said um, that he sees an NFT as a, what did you say, David? Digital receipt. Digital receipt. I mean, I very much view, an NFT, and I really hate the word NFTs, by the way. Um, so do we. Digital asset on <laughs> I know. Blocks, on chain. Um, I see it as a programmable computer. Mm -hmm. You know, verifiably scarce, portable, programmable digital asset on a global distributed ledger, um, where anything's possible. You know, we don't have to do what we we already know. We we don't necessarily have to think um, schemorphically, which is the I don't know why I put it in quotes, but it's just not my word. It's like Chris Dixon's word to say, you know, um, let's not just you know make things look like they were in Web Two. Let's let's think differently. You know, there's no gravity in the metaverse, so you know, let's let's go wild. <laughs> See, you're a futurist. I told you. Um, actually. <laughs> 
David, I, I'd love to hear just a little bit of your point of view, like picking up on some of the things that Premila said about interoperability, payment rails, security. I'm guessing those are conversations you're having I think specifically so. post-acquisition. Well, I think there's some new products and kind of protocols that are coming out to kind of answer some of those challenges. Um, I think we're, yeah, we're, we're looking into quite a few different things to kind of, especially with the kind of improved UX. I think that's, that's got to get better. I think with the security is a big thing. I think the, there's a really interesting place to play in kind of the securities place where it might be joint custody of a wallet or it might be something where your first purchase, you don't even realize you've been issued a wallet at the point of purchase until you get to a tipping point and then it's like, oh, now you've made three transactions and you've earned this much, we're actually going to expose to you that you've had a wallet all along and it's really secure. And It's like it's the education piece, right? It's like yeah. how do you introduce quite complex new technologies to an audience that just wants to be able to go and purchase uh, a digital collectible in the same way as streaming music or purchase an audio book. Like it have to be, has to be an enjoyable experience, one, to get people to come back and do it again, Two, to have a sense of value and worth. It's like there are definitely new products and protocols and kind of infrastructure pieces that are being built right now that are definitely going to make it much, much easier for new users to come into the space. Um, I think that that's having these conversations with the team and trying to, we're doing like big research spikes and figuring out where we want to start investigating further. Um, but I, again, it's like some of the stuff you have to build yourself, some of the stuff you partner with people. Other stuff is like an API that you just, oh, right, that thing works and you can just plug it in. So it's like figuring out the kind of, the different kind of mix of who you work with, what you build yourself, who you integrate with. So I think, but I think all the, the things that Pramila just mentioned are all the things that are going to need kind of ironing out before we get that 10 million, 20 million, 100 million user base that we actually don't discuss NFTs anymore. We just discuss items that we own. And it might be a physical pair of shoes that actually let me then wear them in Decentraland. And it's just, I just own a cool pair of sneakers that are physical and digital. And depending on what environment I'm in, that's how they appear. And I think that's, that's like me kind of projecting maybe a few years ahead yeah, but tipping. yeah but I think that's going to be the interesting bit where you can you, we don't have to describe it as anything different but just an item that I own and I think if I can leave it there that would be nice a nice way to finish <laughs> Well, Holly did you want to pick up on some of that yeah like I was just going to follow on a little bit from what Pramila was saying as well in terms of um like, for, you know, marketplaces really being directed by how users want to use the platforms. Um, I was thinking about two projects that I'm working on at the moment in particular. One is called Wanda, which is an amazing fashion app by a Londoner called Lola. She's incredible. Um, she was at Brown's before, so she's kind of like comes from IRL fashion world, um, but creating this awesome app, which is really um, embedded in the blockchain, but it's about... Um, using the blockchain not for the NFT as a kind of um, a, a tradable asset. It's really about how it becomes kind of to your point, like you, you're not even going to be that aware that you're kind of like it, um, engaging with, it will be AR as well, yeah. Some AR digital assets. You won't really be aware that you're kind of like uh, engaging in NFTs. Um, and then another project from a London, another London-based female artist, Graceland London. It's a PFP project, but it's called Lady Lilith. It's unbelievable. And again, they have some really interesting kind of um, uh, parts of that project actually around staking and trading. Um, so yeah, all of this, you know, where marketplaces are going is going to be driven, I think, by how, how, the, how users are kind of like um, thinking about the space, and I'm particularly excited about the, um, I was going to say financialization, but you, you know, this, this, this more kind of, you, uh, more awareness or interaction between DeFi and NFTs. Mm. I think it's so exciting that the, that the world of crypto and NFTs are kind of like getting a little bit closer together. 
Super cool. Jolly, anything you want to add? They said it all. They said, <laughs> they said it so well. <laughs> no, that's, really, that's I have one quick question to pass around the panel, and then I'm going to open it up for questions. What is the one project that you all are following and are saying, like, this is what good looks like? Uh, a, a big favorite of mine is Hydro Wales Mining Club. Um, so with the NFTs, they buy uh, BTC miners and they do sort of like audit, signed audit report reports each week from the lawyers about how many miners they have, what their yield is. It's kind of distributed to the holders. It's a huge community. They did a really good sale in tranches. Um, they just did everything right that made sense. And I think that's quite rare for a, a, an NFT project that's um, been going for, for as long as it has. So yeah, I'm big, big, big bull on uh, Hydro Wales Mining Club. Okay, there you go. David. It's cliche, but Liam, our dev, demoed something just before I left today around our creator contracts, stuff that we're building. So I'm going to say KO right now, <laughs> which is <laughs> cheesy, but I've got to go with that. Fair. You have to say it. No, no. <laughs> yeah. Um, so our favorite projects. So yeah. Just, what I do you say art or I mean, I would say just chromey squiggles, right? I'm, <laughs> I'm a squiggle maxi. It's just my profile photo. And I don't know if everyone knows this, the chromey yeah. squiggles and art blocks. We helped but, um, build art blocks in 2019. Wow. Yeah. Mm. wow. David also used to go around in 2018 and like shill X copy to anyone who would listen. <laughs> <laughs> no one wanted them back then, but... Yeah. So yeah, I'm a quick on Maxi. I'm gonna say very quickly, um, Utes is one that I missed out on. I think that's a yeah. hella cool project. Love that. But also a little bit of the Alpha. There's a new project coming up. I'm probably not supposed to say, but it's called Dirty Burger Club. And I okay. think that is everyone know that. Freaking <laughs> we know. Yeah, we know the founder. He's amazing. We we know the founder. Dirty, Dirty Burger, Burger Club. Club. Dirty Burger Club. I'm already Club, a fan. Everyone. Just yeah, watch w watch this that space. Absolutely. Yeah, Holly's a good friend for that plug. <laughs> um, all right, questions. Is there anybody in the audience that? Um, no, all too shy. Yeah, I think there's been some great examples of the kind of digital physical twinning. Um, I bought a pair of sneakers that might have even been on Rarible, um, which came with a physical pair of shoes. Uh, but I don't actually wear the physical pairs. I actually bought the physical pair to wear the digital version in the metaverse. Because nice. my avatar, I was sick of my avatar having like default shoes on. Uh, and I was going to a virtual like digital art week and I wanted to like look my best so I literally <laughs> bought these sneakers to wear in a virtual world so I think um, there's a thing called Crypto Kaijus which were pretty much like OG vinyl toys that had a NFC chip in the foot and you pop the NFC chip and it takes you to the website with like the age of the toy, the attributes, the kind of background story, and it's that's those yeah digital physical twinning is kind of where I see the next kind of phase. Yeah, that that can happen with more so with the NFC based stuff. So I think Beeple did a physical digital thing. He basically said. He put it out there and said the physical isn't worth anything without the NFT. So he basically opened, openly devalued the physical being sold on its own, where I've seen the digital pairs of these sneakers sell for more than the physical on StockX. So it's kind of, it's down to the project or the creator or the platform to kind of define where the value is. And then ultimately the market will decide if the people want to wear them, if the ones in the, the digital world make your avatar look cooler than me walking around with these sneakers on in real life. The value might lie over there. But yeah, I'm, um, I'm pretty bullish on digital physical twinning in the kind of fashion space, retail. I think that's a really obvious <laughs> use case for me going forward. Um, I think we're nearly on time, but I will let, let our moderator. I was just wondering if you had a comment on whether there's any utility in in the twinning um, if they could just sell them separately if you just wanted a virtual pair is it I think lots of projects and I'm not saying just in this case 
add physical stuff because it feels like there's so much more utility and there's all this pressure to put onto it. Um, some cases it work and some cases it won't, but it's like it feels like sometimes projects throw in like loads of vert merch and it's like okay you could just sell it for half the price sell double the volume or triple the volume because it's just like you just wanted some virtual shoes yeah. i think i think um i think nike talked about back in 2019 a pair of a pair of soccer boots or football boots that depending on how many like how how many kilometers you moved during the game would affect the dynamic nft which That's i thought was cool. really interesting so i think we're going to see more dynamic uses and the kind of technology being brought into either the fabric or the kind of usage of the material so yeah i think you're going to see kind of dynamic nfts that are affected by real world events or uh, data and i think that that's when stuff's going to get really interesting, when your things online are impacted or affected by what you do in the real world and vice versa. Yeah. So if I do some really cool stuff in a metaverse and my T-shirt starts to go a different color or behave differently, that's when things are going to start getting like really weird and the lines are going to start getting blurred. But that's where the interesting stuff happens. So let's do it. Let's see what happens. That's certainly, physical digital is certainly the future. And, um, you know, the... You heard it here. <laughs> no, but, um, Too much uh, alpha. You, we will start buying luxury goods and having a physical or a digital component or vice versa. Um, it's certainly Artifact Nike are certainly yeah, working on, on a number of shoes that will be uh, walk to earn. Like I'm, I'm, I can almost guarantee it. Yes. Um, they haven't confirmed, but that's certainly what they're indicating. And um, you know, we're seeing it in all different forms. Um, and you know, I've, I've, for example, but art, uh, one of, a great artist, Gordon Berger, who was one of the top ten or first ten artists on Super Rare, um, he airdropped guy. and a, a fantastic guy that we all know. He's wonderful. He has lots of accolades. Uh, first TEDx speaker, right? Yep. First top ten of Super Rare. Lots of different things. But anyway, he airdropped me a physical artwork. I own a couple of his um, amazing his works. I also got another artwork um, physical from Crypto Brauhaus and we, we all were there for Bright Moments London where there was some printing of um, different works from Matt Delorius and, and others. So absolutely, we'll see more and more of that. I think it will become commonplace. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much. Can I get a round of applause, please, for the panel? Thank you so much, guys. <laughs>